Folks, as I drove into church this morning from Milton, I uh, looked across the land that was like a frozen tundra. And I thought to myself, you know, what is the condition of our hearts when we come and open the word of the Lord? Sometimes our hearts can become so frozen over that God's word wants to plant itself into our hearts and it's looking for some great rotated soil that's ready to, to grab hold of those seeds so that it can grow in a beautiful way. But sometimes in life, for a variety of reasons, our hearts get frozen over and God wants to get through to us. I pray that this morning we would take a pause and say, God, may my heart be wide open to you. Can we pray together? Jesus, right now as we open the word of the Lord, I pray that we would ensure that our hearts are open to hear you, that we would hear your whisper. That as the word of the Lord is spoken and taught, that it would land on a soil that is just ready to receive it so that it could grow into something beautiful in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sometimes life can, uh, for a variety of reasons, become a, a difficult thing to live through. There are circumstances that happen in life that, let's face it, can be kind of dark. Situations, circumstances that maybe you find yourself in or have found yourself in or maybe at some point in life you will find yourself in where you think, how are we going to get out of this? What on earth are we going to do amidst this dire circumstance where it kind of feels like there's no way out? That somehow the God of miracles is going to have to intervene and interject my path. And do something that only he can do. Do you ever find yourself in those situations in life? Where there's only so much you can do? That you've kind of come to your wit's end and you're thinking, God, the only way out of this is with your power. You know, we continue our series today out of Jonah, Jonah chapter 2. And Jonah is in a dark place. He's in a fish. I don't know if there's any lights in the belly of a fish, but probably a dark place, a stinky place, a place of unknown. Not many travel in the belly of a fish. And yet there in this dark moment in his life, he meets with God in a powerful way. It kind of reminded me a few years ago, I'm sure you'll remember, there were 33 Chilean miners who were 2,000 feet underground. And they were working away, and then disaster hit. The mining shaft gave out, and they became trapped 2,000 feet underground. How many of you remember that? About six years ago. It was all over CNN. And, and you can only imagine the desperation that these men must have felt. Being 2,000 feet underground, and there's no way out of this. There's no escape route, there's no elevator, there's no other way, exit, they're stuck. In fact, there was a movie that was produced related to this whole true story. And I want to show you a clip, the 33 Chilean miners, and I want you to see the desperation of their situation, not knowing what's next. Watch this. This is all the food we have left to keep us alive. We have to ration it carefully. If we plan on surviving down here until we are rescued. Rescued? Do you hear any drills? That's because they're not drilling for us. We're too far down. It took 100 years for them to dig this deep. How long do you think that's gonna take? Do you think the owners are going to spend that kind of money? They didn't even finish the ladders! They'll wait three days. Then close the mine and put up the gravestones. No. 
No, 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 no! I don't believe that! They'll dig us out! And if they don't, our families will! With a bare hands if it's necessary! I believe we'll make it out of here because, because I choose to believe it! All 33 of us! You see the desperation that they're experiencing? So easy sometimes in those life predicaments to just say there's there's no way out of here. They're gonna just kind of fill in the hole and three days later put the tombstones up and say goodbye. It's taken them a hundred years to get down to where we are. What are they gonna do? How long do we have? We only have this amount of leftover lunch. And there's 33 of us. There's no way out. And then his partner says, I'm gonna choose to believe. Somehow, some way, we're going to get out of here, even if our family starts digging with their own hands. Those dark moments in our life where humanly, it's like, how on earth are we going to get through this? And yet somehow God intersects our path in some of those most darkest moments of our lives. He's the God of miracles. He's the God where, where it seems absolutely impossible, humanly, and God somehow finds a way because he is the God of all creation. His hand is not too short. He's all powerful. And so we go into the story of Ju Jonah in chapter 2, and, and right before I start reading this desperation prayer of Jonah, I want us to read chapter 1, verse 17, which kind of sets the frame for us. It's, it's a powerful verse of scripture. It says that now the Lord provided. I want you to underline that word. He provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God provided a fish. Now, the context is this. Jonah has been thrown overboard because he's the culprit of this great storm. And as he's trying, you can only imagine what he's experiencing. It was hard enough to keep the boat afloat. Imagine being out there into the waters trying to swim, trying to keep your head afloat. Meanwhile, the storm is raging all around you. There's no way out of this. There's no life preserver. There's nothing. And so after a while, assuredly, he, he got tired and he begin, began to sink. And he's going down to his death. And then God provides a fish. The word provided in the original language can be, can be it's even stronger language. It's God appointed, God commissioned a fish. It's the same language that was used in other parts of Scripture where a king would commission and appoint a delegate to represent him or her to another foreign nation. And so they would commission somebody to represent them. Well, here God appoints and commissions a fish because he's God of all creation. And although this man Jonah was living in disobedience, God had told him to go to Nineveh. Instead, he boarded a ship that was going the opposite direction to Tarshish. Doing it your own way can cause great trouble for our lives, can't it? And he was living in disobedience. He was in co uh, complete contrast to the will of God. And that's what caused him to find himself in this predicament. And yet, though he's living in disobedience, God commissions and appoints a fish to come at just the right time when he's going down and realizing this might be my last breath, to swallow him up, not chew him, and rescue him. What does that say about the character of God? That though at times we are faithless, though at times we do or we try to do life our own way, even in those very moments, God's mercy, his compassion, his grace comes and he appoints people in situations to come to rescue us. It's amazing. And so there he is now in this fish, in this dark, confined space, 
And he begins to cry out to God. This, this prophet on the run meets with God in the belly of a fish. His words are very descriptive. And I want you to, to listen to the word of the Lord and the descriptions that are, that are, that are, that are spoken here in, in Jonah's prayer. It says this, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help. And you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, but you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was, was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. What an amazing passage of Scripture. Can you relate to some of these distress calls from this runaway prophet? Where life sometimes it's like wave after wave and you're trying to catch your breath and it just never stops. His life felt like it was ebbing away. Seaweed wrapped around his head. He felt like he was at the bottom of the sea. Literally. Barred in. Sometimes life is like that. For a variety of reasons. And sometimes it's because of our disobedience. Because we've run the opposite direction. And other times it's just because that's the way life is. In a sin scarred world. We will go through trouble on this side of heaven. But we learn so many beautiful truths in this passage. Some observations for us to consider this morning. First one is this. Down to a great God. Down to a great God. There is a downward motion in the life of Jonah, isn't there? The spiral is not going up, it's going down. There's a lot of downward motion in the life of Jonah. For instance, the scriptures indicate that Jonah goes down to the town of Joppa. Then he goes down to Tarshish. He then goes down into the bottom of the ship to sleep. He then goes down into the stormy sea and then down into the fish. Talk about a downer. He's going down and he's going down fast. Down after down after down. Down to Joppa, down to Darsh, Tarshish, down to the bottom of the ship, down to the stormy sea, finally down into a fish. Sometimes life might feel that way. There's a lot of down moments. Downward, downward, downward. And sometimes we feel like, how is, where is God in all of this downward spiral? The fact of the matter is, as much as maybe the motion is going downward, God is still great. I think there's something going on in this text. Because just as the text indicates downward motion in the life of Jonah, God is up to great things. Notice, the language says, God sent a great wind. He then, through the wind, sent a great storm. Then these pagan sailors who recognized the God of all creation had great fear that they came to him and began to worship him right on the boat. And then he sent a great fish. Notice. 
Though at times we're going down, down to places like Joppa and Tarshish and bottom of the boats and bottom of the sea and down to the belly of a fish, God is doing great things even amidst sometimes the greatest dark moments of our lives. Don't ever forget that. God is not taking a day off. He hasn't said, I don't really care about that son or daughter. I'm just going to let them figure this thing out. No. Amid some of the dark moments, God is doing great things because he loves us. Jonah, though you've been on the run, you cannot hide. I love you. My plan is always the best plan for your life. And though you use your free will to go the opposite direction, my grace is still enough for you, Jonah. That's why I'm going to send this great wind, this great storm, and I'm going to rescue these pagan sailors so they understand who, who God really is. And then I'm going to send this great fish. And just the nick of time, when you think your life is ebbing away, you, when you think it's over, I'm going to provide this fish to rescue you. I'm going to commission it. I'm going to appoint it. And I'm going to say, get over there. Amazing. Down to a great God. It's interesting to note that in chapter 1 of Jonah, as we heard Dr. Jim preach last week, there is a whole lot of human activity, isn't there? I mean, yes, it starts with God speaking to Jonah to go to the city of Nineveh because he wanted to rescue those people. He wanted them to come to a place of, of understanding who God was. But Jonah's reaction and response to God's calling was what? A lot of human activity. He starts to make plans. He starts to pack up his bags. Only he's not packing his bags to go to Nineveh. He's packing his bags to go to the opposite direction of Tarshish. Lots of human activity. And then he's got his own resources. What does he do? He goes into his pocket and buys his fare because he's taking a boat. He's using his free will, his, 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 his human activity to run from God. To run from God. You see, God has a plan for your life, but he's not going to force it down your throat. You have to accept it and follow him. Jonah chose his free will to go the opposite direction. He had lots of human choices. God gives us choices. Do it your way or do it my way. Which way are you going to go? Many will take the broad path, but mine is the narrow one. Which one are you going to take? It's your choice. You're going to do life my way or you want to do it your way? Jonah did it his way. He started making plans. He used his resources and he went places. He went the opposite direction. Where did it get him? When you do life your own way, you'll reap some of the consequences of that. What you sow is what you will reap. He opened himself up to all kinds of calamity and disaster, which caused him to be on a boat, which caused the winds to pick up because he was in disobedience of the Lord. All the human activity in chapter 1 turns disastrous for Jonah. Always remember this, friend. That the safest place on earth is to be in the center of God's will. The safest place that you can be and I can be and my family can be is when I choose to do life God's way. So when God says, this is how I want you to manage your sexuality. Something that is so beautiful is to be experienced between a husband and wife. You either do it my way or you do it your own way. But if you do it your own way, you will open your life up to even greater calamity and disaster. When God says, this is what I want you to do when it comes to managing your resources. I want you to trust me with that first 10%. Do it my way. Trust me. It's not for me. It's not because I need your resources, God says. It's because it's for you. So that those resources don't control you and become the king of your life. So you need to learn to give it away. And you need to remember that it all comes from me anyways. So do it. But some of us choose to do it our own way. Well, when we do it our own way, we open our lives up to the consequences of those choices. When God says, you know, this is, I want you to raise a household and children that fear the Lord and it's a place of prayer and where God's the center. We can do it his way or we can do it our own way, but we'll reap the consequences of the choices that you and I make. 
Now, please don't misunderstand me. Even when you do life God's way, that doesn't mean you're not going to experience trouble. The word says that in this world, you will have trouble. So there will be challenges even when you do it God's way. But when you don't do it God's way, you open your life even more to greater calamities and greater disasters. Because God has already told you to do it a certain way. The safest place on earth is to be in the center of God's will. Do it God's way. And you will reap the benefits of that as well. I remember talking to a friend of mine, missionary to a country in Africa. It was a very volatile country and and very uh, uh, dangerous for Christ followers. There was persecution to Christ followers, including my friend and his family who were right in the middle of it. Because God had called them to be there, to be light in the midst of darkness. And he said to me that one day, he, he, his wife, and three children were around the kitchen table in this African nation. And all of a sudden, something broke through the front window and landed into their house. And he looked down in those moments and he realized it was a grenade and the pin was already pulled. And he thought in that just nanosecond thought this is it this is the end of our lives and somehow god stopped that grenade from blowing up and i just was sitting there going wow and he said to me but joel you gotta understand something it is safer for us to be in this african nation than it would be to be in a suburb of the gta because this is where god wants us to be and where he wants us to be he's going to give us everything we need he's going to protect us he's going to watch over us Because that's where he's called us to be. There should be this sense in us, God, we want to do it your way. Because we want your protection. We want your your blessing. We want the fruit to come out of our lives because we've chosen to do life your way. It's when we go our own way, when we run from God, when we ignore his ways, when we think his ways are, are not modern enough for us, where we increase the potential of calamity, to happen in our lives. May there be this beautiful appetite in all of our lives to say, God, we, we want to have the fear of the Lord in us, that we want to make choices in life. We want to raise families that please you, that honor you. We don't want to go our own way. Jonah, because he went his own way, found himself deep in the depths of the sea And somehow, with God's power, was rescued even amidst his disobedience. You see, as much as chapter 1 had a whole lot of human activity, and sometimes in our trouble moments, what do we do? We try to ramp up our human activity. We try to fix our problems. We try try to figure things out. We we Google things. We, We meet with experts, and we do all sorts of things. And none of that is necessarily all wrong. But sometimes we do all of that. And when we've reached our rock bottom, then we're saying, I wonder if I should talk to God about this. Sometimes God brings us into places where you have no other options. That's where Jonah found himself. In the belly of a fish. There's no Google there. There's no light there. There's no no counselor there. There's no expert there. There's no way out of there. He only had God. And we see something drastically happen in chapter 2. There's no human activity, but there's only prayer. The only thing he can do is cry out to God. It's almost like he needed to reach rock bottom to finally realize, wait a minute, everything in my life cannot be done in my own strength. I need God in my life. It's only when Jonah hits rock bottom that good things start to happen again. Jonah realized that hitting rock bottom is actually the best thing that has happened to him. It brought Jonah back to a God who is doing great things. Friends, God loves you that he will pursue you your whole life. Because you are the apple of his eye. Even when you go your own way. He will chase you down and give you every opportunity. He will appoint and commission, figuratively, fish. In this case, it was not figurative. It was literal. To rescue you from your own disaster. 
My prayer is that we don't have to hit rock bottom to acknowledge that God is our sustainer. My prayer is that we'd wake up in the morning and say, God, I got meetings this, today. I, I, I'm going to raise children today. I'm going to visit this person today. I'm going to do this today. But God, I can't do any of it without you. Then throughout the day, before you go into that meeting, before you go into that job site, before you go into that conversation, God, I'm going to need you to guide me and help me and sustain me and strengthen me. And then by the end of the day, when you lay down and put your head on that pillow, God, you are my sustainer. God, I think of you before I shut these eyes. Lord, I honor you. I worship you. God, give me, grant me that rest that I need because God, without you pumping my lungs and pumping my heart, I'm done. But sometimes, let's face it, especially us North Americans, we forget because we have so many options of human activity that we tend to be too self-reliant until something happens and then we fall right on our backs and we think, whoa, I'm nothing without God. Nothing without God. Reading between the lines in the story of Jonah, I think, is a powerful thing to do. As I was, was meditating on chapter 2, I I started to, to realize something that was really meaningful to me, and I, I want to share them with you. You see, there's, there's a bigger story, a bigger narrative that's happening in and through the life of Jonah that I think is helpful for us to acknowledge here this morning. You see, Jonah, isn't it interesting, is that Jonah is from a town called Gath Hefer, which is just five miles from Nazareth. Interesting, isn't it? When you think about Jesus, where was Jesus from? He was from Nazareth. Then you see the story of Jonah. Jonah is asleep on a boat in a storm, the bottom of the boat in a storm, while everyone else on the boat is panicking. When they wake him up, the storm is stilled by his actions. And the action was he was thrown overboard. And as soon as he was thrown overboard, the sea stilled. Does it remind you of another story? Mark 4, to be specific. Jesus is in a boat, he's at the bottom of the boat, and he's sleeping on a cushion. Meanwhile, the disciples are frantically trying to keep this boat afloat. Finally, they go down there, and they're like, Jesus, can you get up? We're dying here. And Jesus comes out, stills the storm. Interesting parallel, don't you think? Interesting parallel. Let's take it a little step further. Jonah's name. Did you know that Jonah's name means dove? Now, when I think of Jonah, to be honest, I don't think of a dove. He's kind of this dark, depressed kind of prophet who doesn't really want to do life God's way. He's kind of, he's more like a raven, like a black raven or something. But his name means dove. And even further, the name also means given to a beloved one. So I start to think, when, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, as he comes out of the water, what happened? A dove descends upon him and lands on his shoulder. <laughs> and then the voice of the Father says, This is my whom? beloved Son. Whoa, this can't be a coincidence, can it? Jonah's story is, is part of a bigger narrative that's happening here. And I don't want us to miss it. Then finally, the clearest, you know, parallel to the life of Jesus is that Jonah was in the belly of the fish. How long? Three days and three nights. How long was Jesus behind that stone? Three days and three nights. Maybe that's why Jesus actually speaks about Jonah. Interesting. In his ministry, he talks about Jonah. And he makes the parallel between he and Jonah. The word of the Lord says in Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus says this. He says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be there for three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Whoa, 
Wait a minute. What's the story of Jonah about? John Ortberg, well-known author and pastor, made this statement about the story of Jonah, and I think it brings some insight for us. He says, the story of Jonah is a foretaste of the victory of Jesus who comes to meet us at the lowest place, telling us, you know what? Death loses, sin loses, sorrow loses, sadness loses, and joy wins. That's the heart of the story of Jonah. It was just a foreshadowing, a foretaste of what God does. He comes into the, 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 the deep recesses of our life where there seems to be all sorts of darkness and no way out. He comes into our dark situations where, where, where it's like you're 2,000 feet under and, and there's no way out of there. And then all of a sudden, he appoints, he commissions, and he calls you, and he rescues you, and he saves you. We're all Jonas. Without Jesus, we're Jonas, aren't we? We're done. We're underwater in need of a Savior. And at just the right time, when we confess, and in many ways, Jonah's prayer in the belly of that fish was a prayer of desperation and acknowledgement. I've missed the mark, God. I now return to you, and I put my eyes on you. Salvation does come from you. Here I am in the belly of a fish. When I was going down to drown, you rescued me. That's all of our story. Without God, we're nothing. Without his forgiveness, without his grace, without his mercy, without his strength, without his protection, I'm done. And then he finds a way in those moments of repentance, in the moment of confession, in the moment of our desperation, in the moment of our acknowledgement of need, he comes down and he rescues us. Friend, he doesn't just do that upon your salvation. But he does that in your entire life. No matter what the situation you find yourself in, no matter what predicament, no matter what situation and circumstance where you think there's no way out of here, God is a God of miracles. He will find a way to meet you at your time of need. In your time of bankruptcy, he will find a way for you to be rescued. Just as he found a way for this runaway prophet, he will find a way for you. It's the story of Jesus. It's his gospel. It's the heart of the gospel. Though you might feel down and behind stone in a tomb, there were those that said, that's it. I guess Chris, the, the, the whole Christian faith was a farce. Jesus has been killed and crucified. But what happened after three days? The stone started to rumble and it was rolled away. And he was made alive and he reappeared to show himself that he was truly the son of God. He wasn't just some prophet or some rabbi. He was the son of God. He wants to prove it over and over in your life that he can roll away the stones that's, that make you feel like you're dead trapped in a tomb. And he will resurrect things in your life. Do you believe that? Do you believe it deep in your heart? Not even death can separate you from God. Yes, circumstances and situations can be dark and bleak and God finds a way for us. But even when we breathe our last breath, if you are in Christ Jesus, you taste your victory. Death can't even hold you down. For the Christ follower, the moment you pass from this side of heaven, you actually begin your life in the very presence of God. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul in Corinthians writes these words. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law, but thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, because of this truth, 
because you know that your eternal destiny is secure because of Christ's death and resurrection, because you are in Christ, because you know that when you go through difficulty, stand firm. Don't waver. Don't turn your back. Don't buy your ticket and get try to figure your problems out with human activity. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Friend, the story of Jonah is a story of God's greatness. Though he was going down, 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 God was great, 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 great all the way through. Don't ever forget it. I conclude as the worship team comes with some images, those Chilean miners. Do you know how long they were 2,000 feet under? Three months. Three months. Approximately 90 days. Just imagine that. Imagine the agony, the desperation. Imagine the family members who are up top, 2,000 feet up. Am I ever going to see my dad? Am I ever going to see my husband? Am I ever going to see my son? Am I ever going to see my friend? And then one day. Yes, it took them 100 years to get 2,000 feet under, but God uses science and technology and NASA and they drill, they drill, they drill, they drill. Then they send this capsule down that's big enough for one person to sit in it or to stand in it. Can you imagine the miners? When that drill bits goes through. Can you imagine that? Oh, come on. You've been under 2,000 feet for three months. And then you see the drill and it breaks through that area that they were stuck in. And then down comes this capsule. And the first man gets in and up he goes, 2,000 feet. I'm not sure how long that would take, but that ride up must have felt real good. Knowing that once he got on top, who was there? Their children, their wives and all across CNN, these men come out and you see these children running to their dads and, their, and their, their wives and they're embracing. God brought life where there was death. And as I was watching this a few years ago, I thought, this is the heart of the gospel. This is what God does. No matter how deep down you are, God gets right down there. The Christian faith is not about you trying to figure out ways to God. It's God coming to you. And he says, come here. Let me rescue you. Let me rescue you to a life that not even death could ever defeat. Wow. Friend, what is it right now you're facing where you need the God of all salvation to rescue you from? Maybe you've come and you're a lot like Jonah. You've been running, 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 doing life your own way, and you have seen calamity path beyond calamity and tragedy and difficulty and disaster, just not working. Or maybe you're in a situation, you're a Christ follower, but it seems so dark and it just feels like there's no way out of this. May faith arise this morning. May you believe again in the God of miracles that no matter how far down into the sea you are, God can commission a point fish to come rescue you.